All right, so hello everybody. My name is Emily Garrigan. I am a certified wildlife rehabilitator here in Pennsylvania. Um, and I am super excited to get to talk to everybody today. I'm a little bit disappointed, right? Like probably everybody is um, that we can't be in person to talk about this stuff. Um, but I still wanted to, to kind of get something together for you virtually and be able to share that with, with everybody here at the um, PA Wildlife Conference for 2021. If you got to see the agenda for the Wildlife Conference, which I'm assuming that you've already looked at if you're here today, I am actually doing two different presentations. So this one here that we're talking about is So You Want to Be a Wildlife Rehabilitator, where we're going to kind of go through things you should think about and considerations that you should make before you kind of embark on this really exciting journey. And then the second presentation, um, which I think is also available the same day it looks like, is kind of the process of how to make that happen. So if you are interested in becoming a permanent wildlife rehabilitator or getting more heavily involved in wildlife rehab, I definitely recommend watching both of those sessions and I would start with this one. Um, so should be on a good track already if you're already here um, and watching this one and then the other one is is a good follow up to that as well. My goal um, with doing these presentations is really hopefully to inspire people to be empowered to kind of embark on this journey. I know as someone who just went through this process within the last few years, it is very much overwhelming and can be um, time consuming and it's hard to kind of figure out where to get started and if it's right for you, all of those fun things that we're going to talk about in this presentation and the next one. Um, so I, I just wanted to have a platform to kind of talk about those things, get you to think through some things, and um, hopefully we can can talk through some stuff together in a Q&A session or after the conference or however we're gonna we're gonna set those things up. I don't know that that's been decided yet as I'm recording this in in January. Um, so I hope that you find this presentation really helpful. I think it's gonna be good for um, people that are interested. In getting permitted and doing more with wildlife rehab and then also those of you that maybe are ready already permitted or volunteering pretty heavily so that you can assist others in joining us as well right because we we definitely need more wildlife rehabilitators as we as we go through um, here in, in Pennsylvania the presentation today it's going to be a lot of me um, sharing my personal experiences and personal stories and then I hope that that is something that you can work with and um, kind of get a basis for your journey as you as you work through here. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, um, so everything that I'm going to talk about today, I do have a handout that goes along with this presentation. So I do recommend if you are like a take notes kind of person and like to, you know, I mean, jot things down, um, definitely feel free to pull that up or print it out or whatever and have that with you because um, kind of the way we're going to set up here is I'm going to go through all these different things that you should consider before you embark on the journey of becoming a wildlife rehabilitator and I'm hoping that this handout that I've put together allows you to kind of put pen to paper think about those things jot notes for yourself and kind of work that out uh, especially if you're you're a spatial kind of learner there to go through those things definitely don't have to if you just want to listen to me talk that's also fine and this is a recorded lecture so hopefully you have, have access to this to go back at least for a little while after the conference but um, you don't have to write everything down that we're gonna go through because I do have some of this already written out for you and then you can can fill in your own notes as well which is really nice okay so first thing that I do want to talk about is kind of my journey so that you can get to know me, this person that's telling you all these things to think about for wildlife rehab, because I think that it's important to understand kind of how people come to be in wildlife rehab. Certainly my journey is not the only way, right? That stuff happens. Uh, everyone's journey is going to be different and you can get to know a lot of the other rehabilitators as well and kind of see how they got started. But I just want to share this with you so that if it is helpful to you um, or for us connecting in those kind of things that you you have access to that right so wildlife rehab was not always what i you know it's not like i was a little girl dreaming of being a wildlife rehabilitator when i grew up um, i've always loved working with animals but it just never quite seemed like the right fit for me i actually started college as a nursing major and went through three years as a nursing major 
Um, any of you, those of you that are nurses, right? I have one of the hardest jobs in the world. That little preview that I got into it um, just was not for me. So I really did not enjoy working in nursing. And I made the decision in college that if I was going to work 40 hours a week doing something, I was going to like it, right? So I didn't want to spend my life doing a job for the next 40, 45 years that, that I didn't enjoy. Um, so that is where I kind of loop back around to the passion that I had um, always growing up was animals. So my first job was working in a pet store. We always had all of these different animals growing up, spent all my time um, in the woods behind my grandparents' house, those kind of things. So I really decided that if I was going to pay all this money and go to college and, and find a career, I wanted it to be something that I loved. Um, so it was 2014 is when I made that switch to study biology at York College of Pennsylvania. And that's really what kickstarted this whole process for me. So as a biology major in college, I knew that I needed some hands-on experience if I was gonna, you know, I mean, go on to, to get a job working with animals, right? That's all the stuff you see anywhere you see like a job posting at a zoo or wherever got to have that hands-on experience. So I was really fortunate enough to get connected with Raven Ridge Wildlife Center, which is in Lancaster County, just across the river from, from where I was going to college. And they were a brand new organization. That's me and Tracy Young, the rehabilitator there at Raven Ridge still, um, that we were able to get connected. And I was really, um, what I want to say, get started with them from the jump, allowed me to have a lot of those really close hands-on experiences with Tracy and being a really integral part of their team because they were brand new and the team was about five of us and, and we were rocking and rolling and, and meeting the needs for, for wildlife rehab. So I had never heard of wildlife rehab before with all of my love of animals and all my job searches and things as I was picking my major in college. I had never even heard of wildlife rehab. Um, but was fortunate enough to get connected with Raven Ridge after hearing about rehab in one of my college courses related to research. Um, so it was it was a really exciting time to to kind of kick off with them, and it was pretty immediate after I I started working with them that wildlife rehab is where I wanted to be. Right. So this photo here, I just this photo is like near and dear to my heart. This is the first baby squirrel that I ever fed, and for those of you that currently volunteer with like a wildlife rehab right you know feeding baby squirrels like one of the first things that you do especially if you're if you're joining in during baby season and, and work with mammals um, so to have this photo just is is very special to me um, and certainly now I've fed thousands of baby squirrels right um, but it's just it's pretty cool and from that first baby squirrel or from that first moment working at Raven Ridge I really was hooked and that was kind of all she wrote, so to speak, um, that was that was what I wanted to, to spend my life doing was was wildlife rehab in one form or another. Um, and it's kind of kind of where it all, all started. In the summer of 2016, I decided that I wanted to kind of continue that journey of learning about wildlife rehab and getting those different experiences. And we'll talk about that later on, either in this presentation or the next one, kind of the in, importance of getting all the experiences that you can. Um, so I decided to take that journey at the Wildlife Center of Virginia. So this is a photo of me here in summer of 2016. And I was originally supposed to complete, I think a 12 week internship. Um, and I made it about two weeks before I was homesick and really felt like I needed to come back to be with uh, Raven Ridge. So I fully admit that I was like the worst intern and would not fault anybody for never hiring me ever again. Um, but I did quit my internship after after two weeks being with Virginia and came back to Raven Ridge and was able to volunteer my time at Raven Ridge um, more than 40 hours a week there that summer. Um, so I did five 12 hour days working with them definitely was very privileged to have um, family supporting that decision to work for free um, and, and not work very much time paid at my regular waitressing job while I was there. Um, but it was cool to get to see kind of a different center, how Virginia functions and then and then come back to River Ridge where I needed to be. And and that was definitely the, the good choice for me. Other things that I did while I was at Raven Ridge is I started to work on some research topics. So it's a requirement at your college. We have to do a research project and 
as soon as I got addicted to wildlife rehab, I knew that's where I wanted to focus my research as well. So I actually did some research on outdoor cats and uh, their impact on wildlife. That's a whole nother conference presentation that I did in 2019 at the PA conference and I've done it at the national conference as well. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that too. Anyone that, that wants to get on the outdoor cat train, I'm always, always talking about that too. Um, but that is really what launched me kind of into this format here of wildlife rehab. I now very much enjoy getting to share my experience and connecting with others and, and presenting in those kind of things. Um, so I have been doing that for the last six years or so that I've been doing wildlife rehab um, is, is something that, that I love as well. Um, so I might have connected with some of you at, at some of the other conferences and things that I've done. So I graduated from your college in 2017 uh, with my bachelor's degree in biology and was still volunteering with Raven Ridge um, throughout my last couple years at college. But then it was time for me to go to the grown up world. My family was no longer supporting my unpaid internship, um, full time decisions, and it, it was time to get get a paying job. Right. So I was fortunate enough to be hired by Zoo America in Hershey. So it's the zoo that's connected to Hershey Park. It's a North American wildlife park. So we only work there with um, North American wildlife. So Canada, United States, and Mexico. Um, so all local wildlife, which is, is really cool, just a little bit different zoo. So I didn't get to work with like lions and tigers and elephants, um, but I did get to work with cool animals like baby alligators and reindeer. Um, so it was, it was really nice. Um, I did continue doing wildlife rehab while I was working at Zoo America. Um, so I would still volunteer on weekends and those kind of things and was still trying to expand my knowledge and interest in wildlife rehab through conferences and, and continuing that hands-on work as well. In 2018, I got the fantastic opportunity and took a job as the wildlife rehab manager with Tamarack Wildlife Center. So Tamarack Wildlife Center is all the way up near Erie. So up in the top was that west northwest corner of Pennsylvania. Um, so I was really fortunate to get to go and work there with that center. Um, that is actually where I got my state permits. So while I was working with them, I went through that whole process and became a permitted wildlife rehabilitator. Um, so again, fantastic opportunity to see how another center functioned. I got to both expand my skills as a leader, being the wildlife rehab manager there and working with their volunteers. I'm kind of expanding on what I had started at Raven Ridge and then also learning heavily from their rehabilitators and their experienced volunteers was just a really cool, cool experience as well. In the end of 2018, so I was with Tamarack for almost a full year um, and then decided that I was homesick and it was time for me to come back home. So all these little blonde faces, um, I'd left four hours away to go and follow my dream job. And you know, that's was my goal um, when I made those big decisions in college and stuff is that I was going for the gold and I thought that I had found my dream job. Um, but you know, you can't, can't beat out the rest of life as well to follow your career sometimes. So I did make the choice in 2018 to leave Tamarack and come back to York County where we are now um, and where West Shore Wildlife Center is with the knowledge that I was going to continue working in rehab, but kind of on my own terms back home um, where, where I needed to be kind of thing. So this is what my wildlife room started looking out. So pretty much as soon as I moved back home and got a new job, um, not related to wildlife rehab, related to my biology degree, but a little bit different in, in pharmaceuticals, um, we started the process of starting our own rehab. Um, so this is what our basement looked like kind of beforehand, just a bunch of junk stored in there. And then we were able to grow that to be a, a decent looking um, wildlife center. So it is just in the basement of our home. Um, I was able to transfer my wildlife permits. That's a whole nother um, story not covered um, in this lecture, but I was able to transfer my state permits that I already had gotten at Tamarack and now had at our location in York County. And we did a kind of friends and family round of fundraising and raised $1,000 to purchase the supplies and the items that we needed to, to kind of launch our rehab. So it was 
um, April of 2019 is when we first started taking animals um, here in, in York County. I was working full time, I still work full time. I'm a training specialist for a biopharmaceutical company, so I get to work 40 hours a week doing that. And we started first with only taking rabbits and adult mammals. Um, so we'll talk about a little bit in the rest of this presentation kind of how to pick what species might work best for you. And for my work schedule and the space and the setup that we had, baby rabbits and adult mammals were, were our go-to. In November then of 2019, way sooner than I thought I was going to, we did make the decision to actually incorporate as a nonprofit. Um, so my original idea was just to work as an independent wildlife rehabilitator, just be that crazy lady with baby rabbits in her basement, right, raising and releasing them. Um, but we did decide that it was in our best interest long term to actually incorporate as a nonprofit and move forward with all of the big goals that, that go along with that. So November 2019 is when West Shore Wildlife Center was born um, and, is, and has been rocking and rolling ever since. So in fall of 2019, um, after we had incorporated and kind of gotten our feet on the ground and were able to kind of expand the caging and the spaces and stuff that we had, we added possums um, to our, our roster of animals that we took. Luckily, I have had a wide variety of experiences in rehab um, and have a lot of that knowledge that we really can take a little bit of everything, but we're limited by by space and, and funding and those kind of constraints. So we were fortunate to add possums in fall of 2019. And then in 2020, um, finally, we got our permits from Fish and Boat for reptiles, which was a big goal of mine. So we took tons of reptiles in 2020 and we added um, in ducks and adult songbirds as well. And then we take a little bit of kind of everything else sort of as we can, but definitely our big focus still, um, at least as I'm recording this as January, are rabbits, possums, mallards, and then our reptiles too, which is, is great. Um, in summer 2020 as well, as we were slowly expanding those species that we took, we also started taking on volunteers. So this is one of our interns from the summer 2020, Brooke, checking out one of our, our possums getting ready to tube feed those guys. Um, so that was a huge jump um, and a huge benefit. I no longer was the crazy lady with bunnies in our basement, right? We were an organization. It was a team of volunteers getting the job done, and, and we were doing some really good stuff. So in 2019, that first year, so from April 2019 to December, um, we took in about 400 patients, which was well above and beyond what I thought that I was capable of doing as just one individual, again, in her basement doing wildlife rehab. And then in 2020, once we had kind of a team of volunteers and we're expanding and the community knew that we were here, we ended up taking in over a thousand patients. So really huge expansion. Um, we're in a pretty heavily populated area. So if you're not um, familiar with West Shore, we're kind of located halfway in between Harrisburg and New York. Um, and we also serve a lot of Adams County, so like Gettysburg, um, Camp Hill, Dillsburg, a lot of other heavily populated areas, which means that there's a lot of people find wildlife, right? It's the way that that goes. Um, so we are rocking and rolling, um, really expanding at a high rate to try and meet the need that's there. Um, so we were able to become a 501c3 nonprofit in 2020, which is now letting us secure some additional funding and get some more of that on the ground um, as we move through. And I keep working full time and we keep expanding and, and just kind of working with what we have to work with, right? Okay, so now I've kind of gotten to tell you my story, just so you kind of have that that backdrop on how I came to be here in the world of wildlife rehab. Now we're going to jump into the actual content. So no, no hard feelings if you skipped listening to me talk about myself for the first 20 minutes. Now, now we're going to jump into the to the meat and bones of things. And I do want to start really at the basics. So I'm hoping that we have a pretty diverse group that's you mean viewing this presentation and finding it helpful. So we are going to first start talking about what is wildlife rehab for those of you that are already volunteering or have been doing wildlife rehab for a while. This might be more of a review for you. But if you are really new or just getting started in wildlife rehab, I hope that this is um, helpful to you because it, it informs everything that we do, right? And everything that you should 
consider is all based on these concepts of what is wildlife rehab, what goes into it, that kind of stuff. So this screenshot here, um, this is from the NWRA, so the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association. If you go on their website, they have a whole page titled, What is Wildlife Rehab, right? And I think it's a really nice description. They go through everything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take kind of each section here, kind of chunk by chunk, and we're going to talk about each one. So this first piece um, is really the most important, right? So the goal of wildlife rehabilitation is to provide professional care to sick, injured, and orphaned wild animals so ultimately they can be returned to their natural habitat, okay? If you don't remember anything else about what is wildlife rehab, that's it for you, right? It's not that we're um, taking animals and making pets out of them. We are not um, trying to save the world, right? We're trying to save individual wild animals and then get them back out there into their natural habitat. So um, especially if you're new to wildlife rehab, sometimes um, that is not understood um, or not as clear, you know, that we're not taking animals and keeping them. Our, our goal is to get them back out there so that they can live and be wild and free the way that they're successfully supposed to be able to do that, right? All right, again, wildlife rehabilitation is not an attempt to turn wild animals into pets. Patients are held in captivity only until they're able to independently live in the wild. Okay, so this is a baby squirrel um, raised and released, you know, only kept the squirrel until he's able to live independently in the wild. So when he's old enough, showing the appropriate behaviors, the conditions, right? Sometimes there are seasonal differences, those kind of things that need to be taken into consideration. But as soon as he's ready to go, He's got to go, even if he's like, you know, your favorite squirrel that you've ever seen. It's time for them for them to go right when they're when they're ready to go, because um, that's that's what we do. We want him to get back out there and get to live his little squirrely life the way that he's supposed to. Um, where you want to just consider this, right? So wildlife rehab is not an attempt to turn wild animals into pets. If we do have animals that are not able to live independently in the wild, so there's, you know, I mean, they have injuries or um, illnesses that are going to prevent that, then a lot of times it means euthanasia for those animals. Um, sometimes there are ones that are able to be placed in like education programs and those kind of things, but even those animals, they're not pets, right? They don't want to live in your living room and hang out with you on the couch like your dog does. They are wild animals. They have those wild instincts. They want to be living in the wild the way that they're supposed to. All right. Often wildlife rehabilitation is an elaborate and time consuming process. That is like the understatement of the year. So again, that's from the NWRA um, explanation of what is wildlife rehab. And that is, is totally true. So it's elaborate. There's a lot that goes into wildlife rehab. There's a lot to know. There's a lot to do. Um, and that's why we have so much training, right? That goes into the, to the stuff that we do and, and getting permitted and those kind of things. And then definitely it is a time consuming process. So a lot of times when we think about wildlife rehab being time consuming, we're thinking about those babies that come in and they need to be fed every two hours, right? Some of our baby mammals and that kind of stuff. Um, but even for something like a box turtle, so this is a female Eastern box turtle that we got in uh, spring of 2019. She's now been with us for almost a year, will be with us for longer than a year for this little fracture um, and also a femur fracture as well here down in her hind leg. Um, so even the animals that seem like they're going to be pretty straightforward, a lot of times it's a pretty time consuming process. And just thinking about being prepared for that, it's not um, fostering a dog that then you can can give back to a rescue, right? It's, it's pretty time consuming. A lot, a lot goes into it. All right, wildlife rehabilitators work with veterinarians to assess injuries and diagnose a variety of illnesses. I want to make it clear, especially to those of you that are new in wildlife rehab, that wildlife rehabilitators are not veterinarians generally, right? There are some, some veterinarians who get their wildlife rehab uh, permits and, and do rehab as well, but in general, those are two separate people, okay? So if I am a veterinarian, my training is medical, right? I go to a medical school, I have tons of years and knowledge um, very much related to medical diagnoses and medications and all of those fun things that are strictly medical based. 
if I am a wildlife rehabilitator, my training is a little bit different. So I may know some uh, like basic wildlife first aid. I might know a lot of the common things that we see in wildlife and kind of how to assess those because they are generally different than the um, small animal domestic animal that a lot of veterinarians have. So I kind of have that that wildlife flavor to it. But really, as a wildlife rehabilitator, our skill set that we bring to the table is the knowledge of these animals natural behaviors and what they need to survive in the wild and how they need to be successful and what we need to do to get them from start to finish so that they can live in the wild. I am not in general, able to read a radiograph and diagnose fractures in most cases, right? I am not um, able to purchase and prescribe medications. I have a very basic understanding of like wound care, but if you bring me an animal that has um, really significant wounds, I need a veterinarian to use their skills and their knowledge that they bring to the table to fix those medical problems and then we can handle the rehab side of things. So just Keep that in mind, a lot of wildlife rehabilitators have a lot of medical training from their years of being hands-on and they've developed protocols with their veterinarians and stuff, but we are not veterinarians. You should not be working in isolation with these injured um, and, and really sick animals. Okay. So this one here, um, this is actually a x-ray of a swan that had been shot. So you can kind of see that in, in the x-ray, right? The fractures that are here and kind of what those wounds look like. Um, it was an older injury, had already started healing. So our veterinarian was able to tell me, hey, this is the injury that we're seeing. This is what it looks like has happened. And then as the rehabilitators, then we can make those decisions. Okay, this is probably not an injury that's going to um, heal in a way that will let this bird, bird survive in the wild, right? So our veterinarians can kind of give their flavor. This is how it's going to heal. This is how it's going to function. And then I can say, okay, is that an injury that a swan can live with in the wild, right? So it's important to have that working relationship um, with your veterinarian and that you're not working in isolation without your vet. I think that's all I want to say about that one. Okay. All right, rehabilitators need extensive knowledge about the species in care, including natural history, nutritional requirements, behavioral issues, and caging considerations. They also need to understand any dangers the animals may present to rehabilitators, okay? Again, that is the skill set that rehabilitators bring to the table in this whole process of finding an animal all the way to releasing it. We know that animal and what it needs in the wild and in captivity so that it can go back into the wild, right? If you are only going to do one particular species, it's really easy to become an expert on that species, right? You can spend all of your time dedicated to learning everything that that animal needs. Um, you get a really um, accustomed to kind of what's normal, what's not normal, right? And how to fix some of those issues. If you are working though where you're taking tons of different species or any time that you get in an animal that you are not familiar with, the thing that's really is more important than having that extensive knowledge is knowing where to find that information, right? So in my second presentation, I actually talk a little bit about some of my favorite resources, um, both in print and online and those kind of things. So definitely check that out either in the handouts or if you watch that presentation. And then of course, your fellow wildlife rehabilitators, right, are, are the go-to. So I have somebody in my phone book that I can contact for almost everything if I get something super goofy and I'm like, what is this? What is it? caging does it need, what nutrition does it need, those kind of things. You want to have those, those tools in your toolkit, right? And then, of course, understanding the dangers. So these are wild animals. Um, working with any animal, right, there's dangers in there. Everything with a mouth can bite. Nothing wants to be here. It's sick. doesn't feel good. doesn't want to be in a cage, even if we know that it needs to be for a certain period of time. So it's really important. Um, as you're thinking about being a rehabilitator and training and those kind of things to understand what those defenses are for all of our animals and also the zoonotic disease considerations as well. So just keep that in the back of your mind. It's not all, okay, what do I need to feed this animal? How do I need to house it? It's a lot that, that goes into that.
Okay. To work with mammals, reptiles, and amphibians, wildlife rehabilitators must be issued special permits from their state, and then rehabilitators who wish to care for birds must also get permits from U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Okay, so this is specific to the United States. The way that our setup is, is our federal government, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they uh, manage birds for us, so migratory birds, anything that can fly over state lines, and then state agencies uh, manage the permits of everything else. In Pennsylvania as well, you also need a state permit to rehabilitate birds. So they're uh, maintained by both the federal and the state wildlife agencies. Okay, so for us in Pennsylvania specifically, um, the PA Game Commission, they handle mammals and birds, and then Fish and Boat manages reptiles and amphibians, and then of course um, federal permits as well for birds. There are separate permits for keeping non-releasable wild animals. So this is specific to wildlife rehab, not education programs, not zoos, those kind of things. There's other permits that, that go in, into those. Um, so we're not gonna really get into the nitty gritty of how you get those permits in this presentation. We will in the second one, but just keep that in mind, right? You do have to have permits if you wanna, wanna do wildlife rehab. You can't just go pick up a squirrel from your backyard. You gotta have the permits and the knowledge and, and the training to do so. Okay, conscientious rehabilitators continue their education by attending conferences, seminars, and workshops, keeping up with published literature and networking with others in the field. Okay, so if you're here today doing the PAWR conference and, and watching this presentation, you, you're already into that, right? Um, so it is really important and it's a permit requirement for us in Pennsylvania if you're in, in PA to do continuing education. Wildlife rehab really is a very brand new baby field. It's really not that old. Um, so things are changing all the time. So stuff that was true in the 1980s is now not true in the 2020s, right? So stuff is changing. Um, we're learning more about the wildlife, about the medical care that they need, about um, their requirements in order to be successful in the wild, right? So you can raise and release an animal, but is it gonna be successful? Those kind of things. So keeping up with all of that changing um, education is, is really important. All right, wildlife rehabilitators can help concerned people decide whether an animal truly needs help. This is what you will spend a ton of your life doing if you're gonna do wildlife rehab. Um, so just as much time as I spend feeding baby animals, I am telling people to leave baby animals alone and, and put them back out in the wild. Um, your knowledge, again, of these natural behaviors of these animals is a huge asset to everybody. People just don't know. Um, and even when they think they know, they don't know, right? But you know what's normal for each animal and what's good for them. And being with their natural parent is definitely the best for every wild animal um, in almost every single situation. So just keeping that in mind, you're gonna spend a lot of time educating people um, and helping people decide when an animal needs help and not, whether that's individuals or businesses or government organizations, that's a lot of what we do is, is share that knowledge with everybody else so that then they can make good decisions. Um, so this photo here, I just like this one. So this is um, an adult Eastern cottontail, right? And she has actually made a nest in somebody's potted plant. It's actually a f like two or three feet high potted plant that she has put her nest in here in this plant um, and is, is coming to feed her baby. So obviously it was a big shock to this person to find baby rabbits all of a sudden in their potted plant on their porch. Um, but mom was coming twice a day, like she should be feeding the babies and then leaving them um, to, to be there safely. And we were able to educate that person on, you know, leave the babies there, mom's coming back. They were able to set up a camera to get, get a shot like this to make sure that she was coming back, which is super cool and, and share that. Um, and they were also, they built a little ramp for the babies too to get down so they wouldn't get hurt jumping down that little two foot planter um, as well, which was, was very, very sweet. So. These stories to me are way better to keep these five baby rabbits in the wild with their mom than if they were to come in and, and I was to raise them. So um, cool stuff like this too you get to do as, as a rehabilitator is educating people and, and seeing them learn a little bit more about the wildlife around them. There we go, okay. Wildlife rehabilitators can suggest humane long-term solutions when conflicts arise between humans and their wild neighbors. 
this piece here of that whole big page long description of what is wildlife rehab. This is the mission of West Shore Wildlife Center. So our goal is to prevent wildlife from needing us in the first place. We want to give people solutions and education and um, help them feel empowered with the knowledge that they can co coexist with the wildlife around them, right? So put a picture here of baby raccoon, definitely the ones that tend to get into the most trouble um, with people and, and have conflicts and stuff like that. But anytime that we're able to share that knowledge that we have as wildlife rehabilitators and when is baby season, what is this behavior that we're seeing that allows, again, these animals to not need wildlife rehab is such a huge service to everybody. Um, so that's going to benefit the rehabilitator. It's definitely going to benefit the animal. It's going to prevent the person, um, you know, that's that's finding these animals. So it's 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 a win win all around right, for that. OK, so those last couple of slides, that is what wildlife rehab is. OK, so and again, that's from the NWRA. NWRA, the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association. And you can go to their website and they have a little bit more information too, especially if you are very new to wildlife rehab um, and, and kind of figuring out what that is, right? But long story short, we want to get animals back out in the wild as quick as we can. We're not turning stuff into pets and we're sharing all that knowledge and training that we have to, to be part of that process, right? Now I want to talk just a little bit about some specific stuff in Pennsylvania, um, since this is the PAWR conference um, in Pennsylvania. Some of you may be from surrounding states and things like that as well. But by and large, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about is going to be very similar to your experiences too. Okay? So this map here, this is a map of PA wildlife rehabilitators as of December 2020. Um, I think there's even been some changes since since this came out, um, unfortunately, we've lost some some more wildlife rehabilitators as well. Um, but this is kind of where we're at. So all of these circles with numbers in them, those are the different wildlife rehabilitation centers. Um, some of these centers are fortunate enough to have more than one wildlife rehabilitator, but by and large, um, it's a lot of single rehabilitators, single centers that that are that are working here. So as you can see right in a state that's as populated and as large as Pennsylvania, there are very few wildlife rehabilitators that are available, right? So especially here in kind of the north central part of the state, there's not a lot of action going on. Um, we are located so here at West Shore, we are in York County. So we're just in the in the northern tip of of York County. So we are fortunate enough to have some other rehabilitators around um, to support us. Um, a lot of them take only certain species, but it's still nice to have some people around us. But there's a lot here in the south, very central part of the state that also is is lacking in rehabilitators and really everywhere is. Um, even for us here in York, again, that we have a couple of rehabilitators that specialize in stuff, we are still very much not meeting the need. Um, so I do hope that as we go through and we talk about today kind of what you want to think about before you be a rehabilitator, I am in no way trying to persuade anyone not to become a rehabilitator. I think that there is a um, piece in the puzzle that everyone can fit into if this is something that you want to do and that you think is is of interest to you. Um, and, and we need you, right? So we, we need people that, that want to kind of join the world of wildlife rehab here. So I'm hoping that this is is empowering as well as it is informative, kind of the considerations that we're going to go through. All right, so let's talk about ways that you can get involved in wildlife rehab. There is no one size fits all option as there shouldn't be, right? Because everyone is different and has, has different considerations and stuff like that. So I'm going to kind of talk about um, the ways that you can get involved. I want to focus mainly on ways that you can get involved kind of as a rehabilitator and kind of taking that next step. Some of you may already be involved in kind of these other options that are here. So you might already do capture and transport stuff, which is a huge help to all of us. Um, you may volunteer with an organization. You may do education programs. You may serve on a board, right? There's lots of ways to get involved if as we go through at the end of this presentation, you're like, wildlife rehab is not for me, right? It doesn't fit with my life right now. There are lots of things that you can do to still be involved in wildlife rehab. Um, so I just want to throw that out there that 
if at the end of this you don't think that you have gifts to share you definitely do and, and there are lots of ways to get involved okay but let's talk about more from a wildlife rehab standpoint okay so there are kind of a couple ways that you can become a wildlife rehabilitator right so you can do um, what we've done at west shore where we decided to create a brand new nonprofit wildlife center okay if you are going to do that and incorporate into a nonprofit you have kind of two flavors there that you can do. You can be a general wildlife rehabilitation center where you take a wide variety of species or you can specialize and maybe only take one type of species or um, a subset of, of mammals or something like that um, at your wildlife center, right? So you can you can be very broad, you can be very narrow, it just depends on what, what you wanna do and what the need is in your area. You also can work as an independent wildlife rehabilitator. So I can be a permanent wildlife rehabilitator and I do not need to start a wildlife center, right? I can just, I keep making fun of myself. I can be the crazy lady in my basement, right? Raising rabbits and get my permits and do things that way and not have to worry about all those business things. And again, you can specialize and work with just a handful of species or you can try and be a little bit more general and take a little bit of everything uh, but most of the time just because again if you're going to work independently you're probably just one person um, a lot of those rehabilitators end up specializing your other option is to join an existing organization so if your um, home situation or your life does not fit doing wildlife rehab on your own, you do not have to do it on your own, right? I can be a rehabilitator and work with an organization that already exists or team up with another maybe independent wildlife rehabilitator and kind of pull those resources and do things that way. If you wanna work with another organization, again, there's kind of two ways that you can do that. You can be a subpermittee. Um, so in Pennsylvania, wildlife rehabilitators can designate subpermittees that are listed on their rehab permits with the idea that they're gonna provide home care. Generally, that's like healthy orphans and things, right? So if we get 50 squirrels in, we might have three subpermittees that are able to take them home and kind of do a large majority of that wildlife rehab process. Or you can work as a rehabilitator on site with another organization. So if they have already an established building and caging and all those fun things, you may be able to get permitted and work with that rehabilitator at the location where they already are, right? Um, of course, that's gonna look different for every organization as far as how they like to do subcommittees, what number of rehabilitators they think is gonna be ideal, but I want to put that out there as an option. It's not like you have to go home and build a wildlife center in your basement, right? You can become a wildlife rehabilitator and work alongside another rehabilitator or another organization that already exists, right? All right. So now that we know what is wildlife rehab, right? What does that, that kind of look like? And what are our options for becoming permitted in Pennsylvania, at least, right? Every state's a little bit different, um, but in Pennsylvania, kind of what are those general tracks where kind of I can go? Now I wanna jump into questions that I think you should ask yourself before you embark on this journey. I think these things will help inform you kind of where you may fit, um, in how you can become a wildlife rehabilitator. So does opening your own organization make more sense or does joining another one? Do you wanna be a subpermittee or do you wanna get permitted? I think some of these questions will hopefully help clarify that for you, especially if you are um, very new to wildlife rehab, whether you are currently volunteering with an organization or just thinking about making that next step. Um, these are important things to, to keep in mind. There's lots of ways that you can tailor wildlife rehab to work in your life, but there are some things that just are the way that they are and, and that we can't really change, okay? This is what that handout that I talked about in the very beginning really goes through, is it has a lot of these questions that I'm gonna um, talk at you about that you can then take notes and kind of jot down your own feelings either now or after the fact as you kind of think about your wildlife rehab process. All right, so first thing that you want to consider is do you have the time, right? So I could be the most dedicated person to wildlife and really, really want to be a wildlife rehabilitator, but if my 24 hours in the day are already completely filled up, there's not a lot of wiggle room there for me to add in wildlife rehab, either as a um, career path or a hobby in, in a lot of shape or form, right? Um, 
when we think about volunteering for wildlife rehab, a lot of centers, you know, you can volunteer once a week, once every other week. That might be something that more fits in if you do not have a lot of time in your schedule um, to kind of dedicate to taking that next step. Um, but if you do really want to take that next step, you need to think about what will change and what will go because you're probably already using up your 24 hours in the day, right? But you might be able to shuffle some things around and make decisions on how you're going to make wildlife rehab work, right? When we think about the time that rehab takes, I think I already kind of mentioned this, animal care is definitely what comes to our mind first, right? So feeding those baby squirrels, um, doing flight checks on our bird patients, right? Going to vet visits, those kind of things. The animal care is what is at the forefront of our mind, but there is a lot that goes into being a rehabilitator, okay? Phone calls are definitely the big one. If you are currently volunteering at a wildlife center and you want to get kind of a feeling of how um, it's gonna work and how, how things are gonna look, talk to your rehabilitator about phone calls. Um, some centers have volunteers through this. Sometimes it's just the rehabilitator, just kind of depends. But you want to get a feeling for how much time phone calls are going to take of your day. So we took in about a thousand wild animals last year at West Shore, but we did about four times that many phone calls, right? Some of those we were able to give education and get families to stay together. Some of those we spent tons of time telling people how to capture an animal and all the instructions and how to bring it to us and then it dies. Um, some of them, we go through all that stuff and then the animal gets away, right? Or we go through things and they take it to another organization. You will spend a lot of your life on the phone, especially during that busy season of like spring and summer. So just keep that in mind. It's not all just, oh, I just need to be available these times a day to feed babies. You also need to be able to answer the phone to get the babies to come to you, right? You, you've got to got to get them in. Paperwork and reporting. So we do have permitting like some of our permitting requirements, um, we have to submit annual reports for the Game Commission, for Fish and Boat, and for U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So that is a non-negotiable. There are minimums as far as the information that you need to collect from individuals that bring you animals, and then also what you need to report to the Game Commission. Um, so there's lots of ways to do that. There's electronic systems that can be used. There are paper systems, right, that you could, could put into place, but you do have to spend some time dealing with paperwork and reporting and, and sending that information out to the appropriate agencies. If you want to start your own nonprofit, you want to consider what those business responsibilities are going to look like, right? So you have to incorporate as a nonprofit. You have to go through that process. Um, you have to submit taxes every year, right? You, there's a lot of things that go into being a business that are not necessarily required for wildlife rehab. But if you do think that you want to start your own center, you need to consider, okay, how much of my time is going to be dedicated to being an entrepreneur in addition to being a new wildlife rehabilitator. Emergency admissions. So, I think it is important for wildlife rehabilitators to set limits and boundaries and hours. And this is when I'm going to do wildlife rehab. And this is when I'm going to be with my family and those kind of things. But you could have the game commission call you at any point and say, hey, I've got an eagle that needs a rehabilitator. Can you take it in? Right. Um, and you definitely can say no to, to those kind of things. But a lot of times we want to say yes to those emergencies or there's just times when, when really we are needed. So, you know, while if rehab is an emergency room, you never know what's going to come in and when stuff is going to need your help. So just keep that in mind um, that, you know, phone calls can come anytime and so can admissions as well, depending on how you kind of set up your life. Uh, vet visits, I think I lumped this in a little bit with animal care, too, but we spend a lot of time driving to the vet and back. So if you don't have a vet that's going to be there working with you on site or that can come to you, you need to be prepared to have the time to take vet animals to the vet, do those vet visits, pay for those vet visits, and then bring those animals back and follow through with their care plans. Releases. Uh, I, I don't know why. This is like my Achilles heel. I always underestimate the amount of time that releases are going to take. Um, so you have animals that are ready to go. You need to get them either back to where they came from or to an ideal habitat to release those animals. That means time, getting them boxed up and put together, 
um, recording that information so that you can then report when you release them, where you release them. You've got to put them in the car. You've potentially got to drive them somewhere, right? If you're not releasing them on site and it takes time. Um, so just keep that in mind, especially if you're going to do things like reptiles or adult mammals that really need to go back to where they came from. If you're the only wildlife center for three hours around, potentially you have three hours worth of driving distance where you're also going to release animals. Okay. Capture and transport. Um, every rehabilitator and organization I think has a different stance on this. So you can take whatever stance that you want to, but if you are going to offer your services to go out and capture animals or to pick up animals that people can't or you don't want them to bring them to you, um, that is gonna take a lot of your time as well, right? Driving around and, and doing all that kind of stuff. Volunteer management. So if you don't wanna be an independent rehabilitator, if you wanna have volunteers, whether you're incorporated or work with another organization or whatever, if you're working with volunteers, there's a lot of training that goes into that um, and just managing them and making sure that you have the volunteer staffing that you need and that those people are ready to go and doing what they need to do that takes up time as well. And then continuing education, again, we already talked about that. That's a permitting requirement. You need to do continuing education, whether that be conferences like this or like online education, or you're gonna be buying books and you wanna have time to actually read those books and get the information that's in them. That's gonna take up time as well. Um, so there is a lot that goes into wildlife rehab. It changes every single day. Um, you never know what a day is going to look like. It changes through the years, right? So I'm recording this in January where I have a Sunday that's free and I really can, can focus on doing this. But if you would ask me to record this in June, my life would look very different, right? So just keep that in mind. Um, the seasonal changes and all of those things that you need to do in addition to just rehabbing the animals. All right, so the next thing that you want to consider um, once you've maybe kind of decided kind of where you want to go as far as wildlife rehab is what species do you want to rehab, right? So even if squirrels are your favorite animal in the whole wide world and you want to rehab squirrels, if you can't commit to multiple hand feedings a day, right? So if I get in a little tiny pinky brand new baby squirrel, it's feedings pretty much two hours every two hours around the clock. That was painful to even say out loud, right? But that is the commitment that if you take in that animal and you're gonna to commit to rehabbing it, that's kind of what you're signing up for. If you work a full-time job and you don't have the flexibility to do that, you might not be able to do baby squirrels, right? Or maybe you can't do really tiny babies. Maybe you can do three feedings a day and you can take older squirrels, right? Some of those considerations you need to work with an existing wildlife rehabilitator or volunteer um, kind of before you make those decisions right so you know oh squirrels i gotta feed every two hours if i'm doing baby babies right um, same kind of thing with possums really any of the mammals if you're thinking about doing mammals keep in mind that generally it's going to be a lot of hand feedings that are going to need you to be with that animal multiple times a day um, potentially through the night as well and that you're going to have a busy season that a lot of times is longer. So if you're gonna do all mammals, March through September, October, you are slammed with, with babies, right? Uh, potentially. Uh, I, I say slammed, but I'm going to implore that all of you do not let yourself be slammed and you set limits and, and those kind of things. But that's gonna kind of be the busy season where you can expect people to need you. Now, the other half of the year, so the winter time of the year, Again, if I'm just doing squirrels and possums, I probably don't have a lot going on. Um, so we do see possums and squirrels all through the winter, but it's more adults that have medical um, issues, maybe like hit by a car or struggling with the cold and those kind of things that are coming in. It's not these time intensive babies. So it is very different depending on the season and, and what it is that you're doing. Rabbits. Um, so I kind of mentioned in the beginning that rabbits is where I started when I became my own wildlife rehabilitator um, here kind of by myself with no volunteers. Again, they're mammals, so you're going to be busy March through September when they're having babies. But baby rabbits are nice. You really only have to feed them like twice a day, maybe three times a day if you have a brand new baby or one that's struggling. 
um, but their natural rhythm, what they're used to, is being fed really large amounts of formula twice a day. So I don't have to get up every two hours through the night. I don't have to take them to work with me. I can feed them before work and I can feed them after work, right? Um, I'm still answering phone calls and those kind of things maybe throughout the day. But as far as my animal care, I can split it to just just twice a day if I'm if I'm limiting myself to baby rabbits. So if you're a mammal person, um, which I'm a mammal person, so I, my heart goes out to you. Um, baby rabbits, eastern cottontails are, are a good place to start. I think if you don't have the tons of time and the flexibility to dedicate to some of those other mammals. If you are a bird person, um, we definitely need more bird rehabilitators. If you could come, please move to your county and rehab birds here in your county. Um, I would love that, right? If you are going to do baby birds, nestling baby songbirds, you're looking at feedings about every 15 minutes. Every 10 to 15 minutes, you've got to be with that baby and putting food in its mouth. There's no like feeding it a whole bunch of food and then it's good for hours or a day at a time. Sun up to sundown, you're feeding that baby every 15 minutes that is a lot of time that you are spending um, and it's kind of a lot of time that is booked up for you right if I take in 20 baby birds and I have to feed each one every 15 minutes by the time I get done with the last one it's time to start over with the first one so keep that in mind if you want to do birds baby songbirds generally take a lot of time and I would recommend just personally that you have help whether that's going to be volunteers or if you're going to work with another organization so that you are not for you know in one baby bird for three four five weeks that you're not stuck with it every 15 minutes sun up to sundown every single day right there's no weekends off it's not like monday through friday i'm in the factory line feeding baby birds and then get to have days off right it's 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 every day if you're committing to that animal ducklings so ducklings are a little bit different so our um, precocial Birds don't necessarily have to be fed every 15 minutes that way. I can set up a bowl of food for my ducklings and most of them will eat on their own pretty well, which is really nice. But ducklings are little poop machines. Um, so the standard for ducklings is that it's time to move them up to a, the next size enclosure if you're cleaning them four times a day. Okay, so that means that there are a lot of times when you are cleaning your ducklings two, three times a day. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's if you're a bird person, right, and you really want to do babies, or if you're going to sub permittee under another organization and take home healthy babies, ducklings are an option that give you a little bit more flexibility. But again, it's not a set it and forget it kind of thing. It's every day of the week, multiple times a day, you need to be taking care of these animals. Adult birds, sometimes a little bit easier to handle um, because they don't need you to feed them every 15 minutes with the exception of some of our insect eaters that don't like to eat out of a bowl. Um, so this is a Carolina wren that we got in that was um, injured and lost all of his tail feathers. He was my best friend because he would eat his lovely mealworms out of a bowl for us, but not every bird is that kind um, and kind of gets with the program. It can take them some time. So you may end up with an adult bird that you need to hand feed every 15 minutes and you need to think about um, you know if that's something that you can can manage can you hand feed that bird if you need to right because you never know what's what's going to come through the door okay but sometimes just really in general overall adult animals are going to be easier time wise for the most part than than baby animals um certainly that's not always the case right because you could have really complicated medical cases or ones that need additional supplemental feedings and stuff that will take more of your time but as a generalization, adult animals are going to require less time than a lot of your baby animals. All right, turtles. Um, this is my plug for rehabbing reptiles. If you really want to be a real rehabilitator and you um, either don't have another organization that you can work with or you want to kind of start your own gig and you don't think that you have a lot of time, turtles and snakes and amphibians they are going to be a really nice go-to for you if that interests you, right? Don't don't do animals that you don't like because then you're not going to want to do it. Um, but if if you like turtles and and rehabbing and can get that experience, I think that's a great option for people that can't commit to multiple feedings all the time or can't commit to building large enclosures and stuff like that that we'll talk about here um, in a second. So for our turtles. It's kind of a little bit different flavor so there's not the everyday time commitment but there is generally a long 
long-term commitment. So a lot of what we see in our turtles and reptiles are uh, the shell fractures for our turtles or fractures in some of our other reptiles as well. Those take a long time to heal. It's just the nature of being a cold-blooded animal that it takes them a long time to heal. So I not, might not need to take care of this animal four times a day. I'm committing to them for potentially months at a time or keeping them over the winter because they can't be released in the winter, right? And these animals do need a little bit more complicated setups and those kind of things. Um, but once you kind of have them set up and you have a nice system in place and you have their fractures in place, they're generally going to be fairly easy to take care of, right? Not all of them, and they all have, have different medical needs and stuff, but in general, a little bit more easier in my experience than, than those baby mammals that need picked up and, and dealt with multiple times a day, okay? Um, we have found that our turtle patients, we do end up at the vet more often, just kind of anecdotally from our experience, um, but we are, we do now have some better protocols developed with our vet that that's, that's not um, been the case as much, but... Um, that, that's just kind of our experience. It's also nice, our turtles, we generally don't get new turtles in, in the winter. Sometimes it does happen um, with ones that are like disturbed from their brumation, the, the turtle version of hibernation, but they're not as active. They should all pretty much be asleep through the winter. So we're not seeing them being hit by cars because they're not walking across the road and, and doing all those things that they do in the spring. So if you need winters off from wildlife rehab from having to answer the phone all the time and those kind of things you might have patients that you're caring for but you might not be getting in the new stuff that you're then having longer periods of time where you're doing shell repair or vet visits and that kind of stuff okay so just something to keep in mind there is probably no matter what your situation is um, if you have some time you you can can find a species that works for you okay Next thing that I think you should consider is do you have the space to rehab these animals? Um, and again, this is going to vary really, really widely depending on what species it is that you want to work with. Right? So this is a barred owl. Um, so an adult owl generally probably isn't going to take up as much of my time as like a baby animal would. Um, this patient, if I remember, they were getting like some fluids and a liquid diet for a while. So for the first couple days, had to handle them maybe three times a day. But after that, they were just recovering from a concussion, maybe meds once a day at most, and they, they were pretty much good to go, right? But this bird right now is in just kind of a indoor ICU type setup where they're recovering from that concussion, but they are going to heal and get better and they're going to need more space. If we look at the minimum housing guidelines for raptors, this is from the NWRA, um, the minimum standards for wildlife rehab, and I look at what a barred owl needs. That's what's highlighted there in that, that blue color. I have their space indoors, right? So it's like two foot by two foot by two foot, basically is their restricted activity area. I can handle that indoors. But when they're ready for unlimited activity and I need to be checking their flight, do I have access to an area that's 10 foot by 50 foot by 12 foot, okay? Probably not, right? I personally do not have the space to build a 50-foot enclosure or a 100-foot enclosure that's really necessary for unlimited activity for a bald eagle. So that is maybe not a species that I can rehab at least from beginning to end, right? We have a really great relationship um, with a lot of other raptor rehabilitators. We have the knowledge to kind of do that first piece, but when they're ready for those big enclosures, they need to go somewhere that has those big enclosures. If you want to be a raptor rehabilitator, that is fantastic. But do you have the space in your yard to build a 30, 50, 100 foot flight enclosure? Or can you acquire that space, right? If you're gonna be, be purchasing property or thinking about those kind of things in the future, right? Um, the same is true for like any animal, right? So there's gonna be needs that they have inside. There's going to be needs that they have outside so that they can get reacclimated to the environment and get ready for release. So you want to look at each species uh, individually and, and consider those needs. Can you meet those needs? And then maybe that informs what species you're going to rehab and which ones you might not. Um, indoor caging space. So, you know, I mean, our barred owl, our birds. Maybe it's just me because that's always been kind of our... Um, 
pinch point is that outdoor space, but you want to think about indoor space as well, right? So this is a snapping turtle, not the biggest snapping turtle that we've ever worked with, but he's a pretty decent size. When he's ready for a full aquatic enclosure, he's going to need a large aquatic enclosure. And I've got to set that up with filtration system, with heat lamps, with UV, UVB bulbs, if he's going to be with us for a long time. Do you have the space to give him what he needs, right? Um, so just, again, Consider that, um, do you have the indoor space to provide him what he needs, plus also 10 box turtles, plus a group of 13 opossums, right? Do you have that variety? Can you set that up? Or do you need to set limits to number the species that, that you're caring for, right? That space that you are gonna pick for wildlife rehab, is it away from people and pets? This is another thing that I think is so important for people to consider. You really should not be rehabbing wildlife from your kitchen table. Um, sometimes that's the way that people got their start or historically if things have happened right, you were the lady down the street that everyone brought the baby bird to. But now that we have a system for professional wildlife care and we know the risk of zoonotic diseases to your family and to your pets, you want to keep that in mind. You really need to have a space for wildlife that is just for wildlife when you're caring for them that is away from everybody else. Um, wildlife rehab is not really uh, an activity for children generally in most most cases. You know, this, this is our dog, Blue. I think she's adorable. So I, I put a picture in here of her just because I love her to pieces. She would love to be in where the animals are, right? They smell really cool. Um, you know, they move around. She loves to watch them, but that is not right appropriate for her. She can sniff my clothes when I come back upstairs to see what kind of critters we've got down there. But I don't want her going down where there's wildlife. Everything that's a mammal comes in with fleas, right? I need to have that space that's separate from her where I can shut the door so that when we're just living in our home, if your rehab space is going to be in your home, that it's it's separate and it's quiet and all those things we want to consider for the safety of our wildlife and for us, right? So just keep that in mind. Okay. When you're thinking about space, keep in mind that you don't just need space for animals to live and be rehabbed, you need also space for everything else that goes in with wildlife rehab. You need a space for people to bring you animals, whether that's gonna be coming into your home. We have space set up outside so that people do not come into my home, right? There's a big sign on the door that says, don't just walk into my house. Um, if you're like establishing a center or working with another center, right? They, If they have a public building, there's probably a space for people to come in and that Take some space. Do you have space for that? Can you set up a space for that if you don't already have it? Um, another thing to keep in mind, which I, I don't think I have a, a photo of this on here, is space for storing things. So especially if you are going to take a wide variety of species, you are going to need a wide variety of supplies to go along with all of those different species. Do you have the space and the means to store all of the, the things that you need if you're going to take everything from possums to birds to raptors to turtles, right? You need to have a lot of items on hand, ready to go that, that take up space as well. So um, again, this, is, this has been our pinch point as a home base rehabilitation center is we run out of space before we run out of anything else. So I just really want you to consider that when you're thinking about what you wanna do the species you want to do, especially if you're going to go on a new venture on your own rather than working with another organization, kind of what space do I need um, and, and what are my needs that way. Okay. Another thing that I want um, everyone to consider before they jump into wildlife rehab is if you are going to describe yourself to somebody, would you say that you are a people person or an animal person, right? So a lot of times, um, just, I know wildlife rehabilitators, right? So we would describe ourselves as animal people. We love working with animals, being around them. And a lot of people would very much describe themselves as not a people person. We don't like people. Um, you know, we'd rather hang out with our animals and hang out with people. I don't want to talk to people on the phone. I don't want to have to deal with people. I just want to work with my animals. In a lot of wildlife rehab, there is a lot of people that goes along with the animals. So this possum, right, look at those adorable whiskers that are everywhere, right, and those big shiny eyes looking at you. If I want to work with her and rehab her and help her, she's going to come with a person attached to it. 
that person is going to physically bring her to you. They're going to call you. They're going to tell you the story of how they found this possum and what they've been noticing and talk to you about every possum that they've ever seen in their life. They are going to call you to ask what is happening about that opossum, right? And how you're rehabbing it and how she's doing and the name that they've given it and this, that, and the other thing. You have to be prepared for that part of wildlife rehab as well. If you really are not a people person and you are like, I do not want to answer wildlife phone calls, I do not want to have to deal with people, then maybe going on your own is not what's going to be best for you. Um, you still can wildlife rehab. Maybe you be a subcommittee and you work with another rehabilitator, they do all of that part, and then you just take the babies that are already admitted, they do the follow-up, they do the paperwork, they do the phone calls, and you just get to work with the animals, okay? That is a fair option um, that exists out there. If you have a rehabilitator that can work with you that way, but it's just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about what you wanna do, there is a lot of people that goes in into rehab too. Um, the other thing too that uh, sometimes people I don't think think about is volunteers as well. So if you are going to take on volunteers, do you have the management people skills to be able to do that, right? Or do you need to set limits so that it's just you and you don't have to take that on if you don't wanna be a manager of volunteers? Um, so, so just, again, things to consider. Nothing excludes you, right, from doing wildlife rehab, but you really wanna do that soul searching and think about, can I handle the people aspects of the job? In addition to the animal aspects, which are not easy either. Um, so I would I would consider myself both a people person and animal person, and they both are very challenging um, and very rewarding in very different ways, right? Okay. Do you want to be a business owner? If you are going to start your own wildlife center, you are a business owner. If you start a nonprofit, you are an entrepreneur. You own a business, you need to treat it accordingly. Um, I pause a little bit when I say you own a business because technically if you start a nonprofit, you do not own it. Um, it belongs to the community. It belongs to your donors. Your board oversees it. You may be an employee of that business, but once you start that business, you are no longer the one man pony show, right? Um, there's a lot that goes into it that sometimes is missed because we love the animals so much and because that is our passion is wildlife rehab for people that start rehab you better be be passionate about it and love it um, but if you're going to be a, a non-profit organization there's more that goes into that right um so just just keep that in mind if you do not want to be a business owner if you do not want to start a nonprofit, i fully empower you in that but you wanna think about how you are going to pay then for your rehab stuff. Um, so uh, people want to support you, I'll, I'll say that. So people want to help you in your rehab. I mean, we're doing it for free. You cannot legally charge for wildlife rehab. So I can't say, oh, it's gonna cost you $60 to bring me that opossum, right? Cannot charge for wildlife rehab. You can accept donations. Um, but you cannot make people pay a fee to bring you an animal. If though I'm going to my veterinarian and I need x-rays done and I need medications and I need an exam done, likely they are going to charge me for that, right? Um, so we are fortunate enough to have veterinary partners that can offer us discounts and let us buy certain medications at cost and things like that. But I still need to pay this professional that went to vet school and has a lot of student loans and, a, and an organization to run. I need to pay them as a for profit company for the services that I'm using. Right. So this is just a vet bill. Um, I think this is for a turtle, most likely just looking at. Yeah. So this is that was for this female box turtle that had the two leg fractures. That's who that's for. Um, so this is her vet visit. Right. So we paid for radiographs. We paid for medications. We were fortunate enough that follow ups were covered. Um, and our veterinarian donated his time to do the exam, but he needed to charge us for the meds and for the x-rays themselves. And we receive a small discount on that. But for one turtle, I mean, we have a vet bill of over $150 for that, for that one vet visit. So just keep that in mind. If you're not going to start your own nonprofit and fundraise, which you have to fundraise, if you're going to start your own nonprofit, money doesn't just come out of nowhere. You do have to work for it. Um, but if you're not going to do that, how are you, how are you going to fund your work, right? Do you have the funding to do that? Um, 
or are you going to work with another organization maybe that's going to cover some of those costs but then then you won't have to to pay for that right if they do fundraise and and can assist you okay just something to, to, to keep in mind it's not free to do this it, it does cost some money If you do decide to start a nonprofit, again, I super empower everybody to make whatever decision works for them on this, but um, you do need to consider that it is work to start the nonprofit and to manage it as well, right? So this is just this is just a, a little snippet I found from um, another organization that goes through kind of all the things that you need to do to start a nonprofit. And then there's like a whole nother laundry list of things that you need to do to manage the nonprofit. Um, so just again, as anecdotally now that we are incorporated as a 501c3 tax exempt nonprofit at West Shore, I really spend almost none of my time doing animal care. Um, so there's maybe just a handful of days a week that we don't have volunteers that I go and take care of the animals and clean cages and feed babies and that kind of stuff. But the rest of the time I am fundraising and I am getting the volunteers to come and do things and um, networking and communicating with our donors and putting together reports and all these different things that we need to do as a nonprofit organization so that we can care for a thousand animals a year right so just keep that in mind um, in the second presentation that I'm doing for the conference we'll talk a little bit about what goes into starting a nonprofit um, I don't go into a lot of detail on it because it really could be its own separate conversation um, and I want to focus a lot of that time on the permitting requirements and things that really apply to everybody um, but I'm happy to talk to anybody individually if this is an avenue that you're thinking about going down and have questions please 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 feel free to reach out to me we just did this so it's it's all very fresh in my brain as far as what I think you need to know and consider and, and kind of in what situations this this makes the most sense right so I can give you my, my two cents on that okay do you know what the job looks like do you know what it really looks like to be a wildlife rehabilitator I could show you pictures and videos and screenshots and everything um, but do you know what it looks like hands-on every day the only way to get that information is to do it. You really need to, if you're going to become permitted, you need to have that hands-on experience. And I would um, highly recommend that you practice before you become a excuse me, a rehabilitator. So if I want to rehab baby rabbits, I should practice what that commitment looks like and kind of what that feels like from beginning to end before I make that jump. So you really need to find that rehabilitator that can work with you and um, can show you what that looks like in an honest way while still empowering you to become a rehabilitator. Okay, So that's, that's what I'm gonna say about that. Um, so let's go through just some specific things. And again, this is just a list that came to my mind of things that you should really consider and maybe people don't always remember to think about. But again, this is not all inclusive and will depend slightly based on what species you want to do, how you want to set yourself up, if you're going to go on your own, if you're going to work with somebody else, those kind of things. Okay. First thing that you should consider are zoonotic diseases. So working with wild animals does not come without risks for it, right? So Every single animal that you come in, I feel like, has parasites on it. Do you want to be bringing fleas into your home with every wild mammal that you admit, right? Do you want to be bringing flat flies into your home with every bird of prey that you admit? Do you understand what those zoonotic diseases are? And can you prevent yourself and your volunteers and your family, if you're rehabbing at home, from being infected with those zoonotic diseases, okay? Again, this could have its own completely separate topic, so I'm not going to talk about a lot of that, right? Um, but, but you need to get that hands-on training and go to conferences and learn more about that um, so that you are an advocate for yourself and for everybody else, right? So this COVID-19, okay? Um, so the coronavirus pandemic, it started when a zoonotic disease transferred from animals into people and that's you know I mean that's what zoonotic disease means it's a disease in animals that has that ability to transfer to people um, and as rehabilitators who are working with wild animals in our hands every day 
it is important that we understand biosecurity and that we are keeping ourselves safe and everybody else as well. Um, other things, you know, they're listed here, antibiotic resistance, things impact more than just you and your animals. Um, so keep that, keep that in mind. Um, make sure that's part of kind of your training as you're, as you're focusing on here is how am I going to keep myself and everybody else safe when I'm working with these wild animals? Okay? It takes a lot of responsibility. Okay. Are you able to handle the gore and guts that comes with wildlife rehab? Um, I don't think that I can understate this or I can't overstate this enough. We see animals that we really care about, right? So um, we love these wild animals. They're very special to us. We get to know them on a personal basis and you will see them on the worst days of their life, right? Can you handle that? Can you deal with the guts and the blood and the gore that just comes along with it, okay? Um, so here's your photo warning. I'm going to show you a couple of gross photos. Okay, feel free to like close your eyes or look away and just listen to me talk through these. Um, but if you're going to be a wildlife rehabilitator, you're going to see gross, horrible, bloody animals. That is, is very sad and it should pull on your heartstrings and it, and it does a little bit. Okay, so this one here, this is an adult um, eastern cottontail that came to us. Definitely not the worst state that I've ever seen a uh, cottontail come in. Um, we don't know exactly what happened to her. We suspect that she was stuck either in like a box trap accidentally or became stuck like under a fence or something like that where she was bashing her face to try and escape. So um, this is before the wound has really been cleaned up at all. This is a state it came to us in. It actually wasn't too badly um, dirtied up or anything, which is, is really, really nice. But that wound on her nose is all the way down to the bone. Um, so it's pretty gross. I've got to pick up this animal now every day and clean that and dress that and take care of that wound. And it's going to look gross. It's going to smell horrible, right? Especially if you get an animal with an infection in their wound, it's going to smell very, very bad. Can you handle that disgusting, gross wound smell um, for these animals that, that come into your care? Okay. Good news is about this one, um, she did do fine. So this is her towards the end of her rehab process that scabbed over. Um, she was with us for a couple weeks after this photo was taken to let that process kind of finish up and, and first start to grow back in. Um, but you know, I mean, this is one of the, the good success stories, but it is not always that way, right? Um, baby rabbits in particular. So rabbits are not for the faint of heart, I will say that. So I, I recommended them in the beginning, but now I'm gonna say, Maybe not for the faint of heart. Um, so lawnmower incidences are a big thing that we get for rabbits. And um, people will bring us rabbits that are missing like part of their heads. Um, we got a rabbit in one time from Weed Whacker incident that literally the animal was cut in half and was still alive. Can you see that and react the way that you need to, right? So something like those cases um, euthanasia is going to be the option for that animal, right? If you're missing half of your body, there's nothing that I can do for you, right? Other than end your suffering, which is such a huge gift to give to that animal to end their suffering humanely um, and, and to do that, right? So can you do that and can you do it successfully in a way that's good for both you and for the animal? Mm -hmm. All right, so there's a break between the last slide and this one because I had to go deal with an injured raccoon that just came in. So that's that's the life of a rehabilitator if you didn't get it already from the from this presentation. This raccoon showed up, so we get to go and we get to deal with it. Um, so I'm trying to remember where we were. So I think we were just talking about injuries and stuff like that to animals. Um, and then this slide here, I just wanted to talk about this one. So this is a mallard um, that we got in that had actually been shot with a crossbow. So keep in mind too that accidents and things happen, right? And their injuries and they're difficult to deal with and that kind of stuff. Um, but also intentional harming of wildlife from people happens as well. So it's important to consider that, um, you know, I mean, the just the emotional and the anger toll that that takes in addition with having to triage this patient with his injuries dealing with um, now a legal issue, right? Because he's a migratory bird, should not have been shot with a crossbow. 
um, and and caring for the patient and yourself and, and the public and everything. So just keep that in mind um, when you're thinking about injuries and stuff like that. Excuse me. All right. Um, here's another one. So this is just a picture of one of our turtles. By and large, a lot of our turtles, especially, um, and a lot of our other patients as well, come in after being hit by a car. So as you can imagine, right, if you're just a little tiny critter and you get hit by a car, there's going to be injuries that come along with that. And the only time that I've ever gotten physically ill from doing rehab stuff was putting a turtle shell back together. It is... Um, a process that, I mean, it looks really nice in the end, but it is, it is not fun to deal with all those moving parts. And, you know, I mean, thinking about how that animal's feeling, that's, that's impacting you as well, especially because, you know, um, from working from them, how they feel things and, and the pain that they feel and stuff. So, um, it is not for everybody. And if you don't think that you can handle Things like this um, with the, the guts and the gore and the injuries just either on an emotional level or like a physical level, it's not bad. It doesn't exclude you from doing rehab. You just maybe need to work with um, animals with different kinds of reasons that they're in rehab, healthy orphans that need raised, those kind of things, rather than dealing with the more medical side of things, which, which goes along with rehab. But that's where teaming up with another organization or working under another rehabilitator is, is a good choice. In addition to all of the guts and gore that makes our skin crawl, you also want to think about parasites as well. So especially in the summer, any baby animal that's like been orphaned for any period of time or any animal that's injured, it's probably going to have fly strike, which is when um, flies come in and will lay eggs, maggot eggs, and or the maggots hatch um, on that animal. For me, it, I mean, really is the maggots still give me the heebie-jeebies, creepy crawlies. For other rehabilitators, it's like the fleas or the flat flies like birds of prey have. But almost everything comes in with some kind of parasite. So again, it's just working with somebody to know how to treat those, but also keep it in check kind of your own creepy crawly feelings, you know, I mean, when you're when you're dealing with gross fly eggs and things on, on an animal. So that's what this is, um, the... This baby bottle here was filled with just regular clear water, if I remember correctly. And then uh, we were pulling fly eggs. All those little grains of rice are fly eggs off of a possum um, who was tangled in some garbage in like a milkshake lid and had some pretty bad injuries that, that then flies took advantage of. So uh, just keep that in mind. It's stuff that makes your skin crawl. It's not just the injuries. It's the parasites and, and those kind of things, too. So the next thing that I want to talk about are some of the emotional aspects of the job. And some of this has already kind of come in just when we were talking about some of the other topics as well. Um, but now I want to kind of call it out specifically. So there are a lot of really emotionally challenging things in wildlife rehab. And really one of them, even though it's like our goal of rehab and it's like the best thing, it can also be very challenging and that's going to be releases can you take an animal that you've been working with for days weeks months years in the case of some um, animals and can you take it and put it back out in the wild never to see it again not to know what happens to it even knowing the challenges that it faces can you do that to an animal you know i mean that you've you've become close to um in rehab so we try to separate that as much as we can <clears throat> As rehabilitators, we know that they're not pets, right? They're going to go back out into the wild. We work really, really hard to make sure that they don't like us, that they don't get too habituated with humans. But, you know, we're, we're animal people. We're animal lovers. There's no way to separate that isolated totally from each other. Rehab world and animal loving world, right? They, they go together as they should. So... Um, it's just important to recognize that, that there are cases that are going to pull on your on your heartstrings and be able to deal with that. So um, this one here, I just put this picture up here. So this is a possum that we cared for last year. That She came in as a little teeny tiny baby, um, Joey, and actually had an injury to her ear. And you can kind of see that there in the picture, like her, her ear that's closest to us just looks a little crumpled at the top. She had an injury, had to be on antibiotics and separated from her siblings. Um, so... Um, yeah, just the antibiotics and stuff we think maybe stunted her growth a little bit and she had some some other challenges. So she ended up staying with us through the winter. She didn't make it in time to release um, in 2019. So she was released in early 2020 and was with us that whole time. And we worked 
really hard to make sure that she didn't like us while also, you know, me growing very attached to her, right? We figured out her different quirks, her personality, things that she liked and didn't like through enrichment and, and food items and things. So you do become attached to these animals. You put a lot of time and effort into them, but you do have to be able to let them go and release them. We don't, we don't get to keep stuff. I mean, it's, it's going to be released or euthanasia is, is the end all um, for a lot of our other animals. So again, just something to, to keep in mind. Um, it's not easy and you want to kind of practice that, that release process before you before you take this on right while you're in training and learning and those kind of things not something right so if releases are hard euthanasia and death are probably just as hard and just as big a part of the job if not bigger um, so by and large kind of across the board of all rehab centers no matter what they take no matter what their size kind of what their setup is a 50 percent success rate is considered extremely excellent right so getting 50 percent of the animals that come in back out into the wild is amazing um a lot of times it's a lot lower than that especially for centers that are open to everything or take some of the more challenging species or take in things that are um really injured that's going to be much lower uh, but even for places that take in really just like healthy orphans that that don't have a lot of medical needs a lot of times 50 percent success rate is considered really good so if you are going to do wildlife rehab you have to be able to deal with the euthanasia and the death and i don't know which is easier the euthanasia or stuff that just dies on you they both are challenging in very different ways um, so this is a photo of some rabbits that came into us and if you can kind of see there for all of them their spines um, are very pronounced they also are way underdeveloped for the the age that they are so they're starting to show some of those characteristics of being an older rabbit with their ears are standing up and their their fur is coming in really nicely um, but they are very very small so these guys were malnourished um, for some reason or another i think they were found as orphans um, they actually started coming out of the nest probably looking for mom but at this stage of emaciation and especially with with rabbits and how fast they grow being that long without the calories they needed these animals were beyond the point where we could save them right so it's hard sometimes to make those decisions of okay this animal is beyond what i can save with the veterinary and the rehab knowledge that we know it's it's beyond the point of saving um same is true for things that come in injured right we need to consider okay with these injuries and all the knowledge that i have to be able to fix them when the rehab process is done, is this animal going to be able to be released and will it be successful in the wild? So there are sometimes animals that come in, um, you know, maybe you could amputate a leg and it would live, but what does that quality of life look like? Can it be released into the wild? Does it have any quality of life if it needs to stay in captivity? Or can you make the right decision for that animal and choose euthanasia? Okay. Um, it's not anything that necessarily gets easier um, with time. I mean, sometimes it's it's harder than others and they're just those those patients that speak to you and, and make it a little bit more challenging. But again, that's one of those things that you really want to practice what that looks like and how that makes you feel um, emotionally before you sign up to, to take in these animals because you don't want to get in a situation where you are causing undue suffering or hanging on to animals that, that really should be euthanized, right? Um, and then the death piece as well. So, I mean, animals all the time we get in and they just die. Could be stuff that seems like it's totally healthy and there's just some reason that it dies. Um, could be something that we did wrong, right? That happens. Um, could be just something that we can't see. Maybe there's something internally, some kind of genetic defect that we can't notice. Uh, but you need to be prepared for that as well to come in and your patient just be dead. All right. Um, Again, doesn't get easier necessarily, but it just is a part of the job. The hardest cases, at least for me personally, for euthanasia are the ones of um, animals that are physically healthy, but maybe not mentally healthy. So this is a squirrel that came to us that was raised by a member of the public alone. Um, was found as, as a baby and lived its whole life just with this one person and then they 
realized what they were doing was not what they were supposed to be doing and turned over now this full grown adult squirrel to us that um, did not recognize other squirrels, did not know that humans were different than squirrels. He really didn't even particularly like us in general. Um, so he did recognize that we were different than the person that had raised him, the only person that she'd ever seen. Um, but she was not mentally well. Um, and for animals that are not able to be returned to the wild, our two choices are placement for them in like an education program or someone that has, has permits, um, like a zoo facility or euthanasia is, is the other option. And when we are considering placement for our animals that are non-releasable, you really do have to consider, is it what's best for the animal or is it what feels best to the rehabilitator, right? So um, there are very few squirrels that would do well with life in a cage for their whole lives. You know, I mean, they want to be free. There's things they need to do and natural drives and behaviors that just cannot be met in captivity. Um, and there's some species that do better than others. There's certainly individuals that do better than others. So there certainly are squirrels that do fine in captivity and thrive and, and do well. It just is on a case by case basis, but you have to be prepared to make the right decision for the animal and to make the legal decision. If there is no legal placement option for that animal, you need to be able to make the euthanasia decision. And it just is what it is. And um, you need to be prepared to deal with those emotions as they come and accept them for, for what they are and, and the valid emotions they are. Uh, but that is definitely uh, something that's challenging for, for all rehabilitators. So again, just keep that in mind. You're going to have to make tough choices and you want to have people in your corner that are your support system through that. Can you deal with crappy people? Um, so if you've ever heard like a rehabilitator complain about anything or um, we ha sometimes have conference topics and stuff like this um, on these types of things, can you deal with just straight up garbage people? Um, so this, these pigeons here, so these are both banded uh, domestic racing pigeons that we took in because we were able to find homes for them. Um, the one in the little doorway there of the rabbit hutch that they're hanging out in, his name is Pringles and his owner that owned him before, cause he's a banded pigeon. He was a domestic bird. He's not a wild bird. Uh, when we let him know that we had his bird and he had an injury and was not going to be able to fly back home as a homing pigeon the way that he was supposed to, the gentleman told us to stuff him in a Pringles can and throw him in the river. All right. So that feels bad. Um, makes you angry as someone who, sees this animal in front of them and recognizes that animal, you know, I mean, as the individual that they are and cares for these animals on a daily basis, that just feels horrible um, to hear somebody say that for something that, that you're so passionate about. So you do have to be um, prepared to deal with what that feels like internally and also be able to deal with it externally as a professional who's representing yourself um, representing an organization if you're working with another rehabilitator or start your own organization and then just also rehabilitators in general so if we are lecturing people and making people feel bad when they make terrible choices or keep the baby squirrel for weeks before they bring it to you if you are making them feel like crap they're never going to bring any other animal to a rehabilitator so we do just need to keep that in mind that sometimes just really crappy stuff happens and we have to kind of put our professional hat on and deal with that. But that is definitely one of the things that never gets easier is dealing with people that are just nasty and horrible, but that kind of goes along anywhere. I won't say that's exclusive to wildlife rehab, right? That could be, that could be anywhere. When you are thinking about if you want to take rabies vector species, you need to think about the zoonotic disease considerations that go along with that. Can you euthanize a baby raccoon that otherwise seems healthy if someone's been bitten and potentially exposed to rabies? That just is a uh, reality of working with rabies vector species is that happens. Um, you need to follow whatever your instructions are from the Game Commission and from the Department of Health. So if the Game Commission says, you know, that animal needs to be euthanized and tested for rabies, you either need to euthanize it or turn it over to the game commission for that to happen. Um, so it definitely is a turnoff for some point for people for doing raccoons because, I mean, you can't, look, look how cute he is. You just can't resist that and members of the public can't. And it, 
you have to have some level of empathy for understanding that and they see on the internet putting your fingers in baby raccoons mouths and stuff and they get exposed and we need to prioritize legal considerations and human health over that individual animal sometimes and that's that's really tough um and it definitely does emotionally affect you as as a rehabilitator and again you need to acknowledge that and address that and have a support system in place and whatever that looks like for you on how you're going to handle these cases if you choose to do raccoons maybe you don't because you don't want to deal with that and you don't want to deal with any rabies vector species or bats or skunks or whatever and then you can do do other animals right okay do you have the patience to teach so much of what we do as wildlife rehabilitators is telling people all the things that they know about wildlife are wrong um, people have lots of myths and misconceptions about what's normal for wildlife and what's not th that it's just so deep-seated that it's going to take us eons until we can kind of level the playing field and and really get people educated on on wildlife behavior and, and natural stuff and what they need to do and those kind of things so do you have the patience when people call you with a baby rabbit to tell them about rabbit normal nesting behavior what the nest looks like that it's normal for them to be alone they need to not pick at the nest all the time. They need to put the baby back and then leave it be, right? Do you have the patience to explain that to somebody and explain it about seven times every day? Because even though you've explained it seven times, the person that you're talking to has always heard that if you touch the baby bunny, mom's never going to come back and she's abandoned them. They're by themselves and they, they need help, right? You need to be the professional and be able to have patience to kind of meet people where they are knowing that they've always heard that you can't touch the baby rabbit and now you're telling them something totally different it's it's wild um you know it's what we do right when we, we teach people and, and we do that so you have to have the patience to be able to do that so this is obviously a very healthy um very brand new newborn baby bunny so probably would not do well at all in a rehab situation for how young he is and you can see it looks like he's about to explode so that's what baby rabbits should look like they should look like they're about to explode um, so that's that's a healthy bunny. He should be he should be put back, right? There's another one. Um, this one actually came in for rehab, unfortunately. Um, the I don't remember what the situation was. They wouldn't put him back, or you know, I mean, there was some kind of misconception. But again, this baby, very full, lovely belly. He was being cared for by mom. He should have been put back in the nest. Right. Here's another one. Um, so his foot's kind of in the way, but you can see, it looks like a big old balloon of baby bunny should be put back in the nest. Um, this one here, so the caller called us about some baby bunnies and said that they were all over the yard. Um, it later came to be that she actually had multiple nests in her yard from multiple different adult rabbits and thought that they were just all over the place. Um, but they were healthy, well-fed, well-cared-for rabbits from two different litters, at least two different litters, um, and they, they should have been put back. So do you have the patience to kind of figure that stuff out and be the detective and then tell people what they need to do? Pull the bunny back, right? Say that five times a day, every day from March through September. Put the bunny back, put it back, put it back, put it back. So just again, people's fears about wildlife, the myths that they believe, um, just their, their ignorance, they just don't know any better. That is so deep rooted and wildlife rehab is so new that we really have to be that advocate for these wild animals and have that patience to teach people in a way that's effective. Um, so we really want to change people's attitudes and mindsets on these wild animals so that um, as their habitat shrink and more and more wild animals are coming in contact with people that those interactions are not harmful um, to our, our wildlife, right? Because that's what we that's what we really care about and and you know are trying to, to prevent overall. Um, and it is so important to always be professional and understanding of where people are in their understanding of, of wildlife and how we can meet them there. So this is obviously a black rat snake. This is actually one that lives in the, just a pile of old wood that we have at the wildlife center. So he's occasionally out basking and stuff. He just sits there, lets me come up and take these photos and eyeball all over him because I love him. Um, but you know, there are so many people that would see a snake just sitting there and will go get a shovel and try and kill it, right? Because they are terrified and the media tells you, you know, I mean, movies and stuff, everyone's scared of snakes, you know, my mom, my grandma and every, you know what I mean? They're all scared of snakes. You want to help people come to kind of the light and be like, oh yeah, he's fine. He's there. He's taking care of your mice problem. 
probably won't ever see him. And you know, I mean, it's not like he's gonna come and eat your dog, right? Um, so you just need to, to understand what's going on. And we're new as the rehabilitators, these old myths and things, those are old, that's what's deep seated. What we're telling people is new, so we need to be prepared to meet them where they are. Okay, um, this one, so this is really important to me. So before you start rehabbing, who is going to be your support network? Okay. So who are you going to call when you need support? So when you have those really tough emotional cases, when you don't know what it is you're supposed to do, or you just want to complain about something, who is going to be your support network? One of your most important people in your network should be other wildlife rehabilitators, right? So this again is uh, me and Tracy from Raven Ridge Wildlife Center. We still have a super close relationship. We're close physically together. So we share a lot of patients and, and network and that kind of stuff. But also um, just like if something stupid happens or I need to vent about somebody or if something totally goofy happens that like only a rehabilitator would know and I want to share it, that's the person I'm going to share it to, right? So you need to have those other rehabilitators in your network, whether they're in PA or beyond, just somebody that understands what it looks like, what your life looks like that you can share with. Because I can promise you that even the people that think they know, even the people that you live with, they just don't know. Um, just is the nature of, of the job. So it's so important to have those, those supports, both professionally to help with your animal care and your rehab care. And then emotionally as well, that you have that, that contact too. Right? You want to make sure that you also have family support as well. So a lot of people sometimes get into rehab and their family does not understand the time commitment that it's going to take, or that you're going to take over, you know, I mean the spare bedroom just for wildlife. Um, and that, you know, a lot of times it's an individual activity unless they're really interested and in, in volunteering with you as not they can come in and hang out and play with possums, right? It is, um, it's a, it's a professional hobby, even if you're not doing it as a job. So just something to keep in mind. You want to have that family support and understanding. Those people are also good for keeping you accountable for boundaries. So if you say, um, I'm only going to take 30 animals and then that's my max having someone that can hold you accountable for that kindly, right? So hopefully your family loves you and can do that kindly. Um, that's, that's really excellent to have too. And I would also recommend that you have friends and support outside of rehab. So those are the people that can tell you, you know, you can turn off the phone for an hour and come to dinner and drinks and whatever, and, and we'll get you kind of out of that rehab world when you need it too. So don't, don't discount those people either. You also want to think about bringing on people to support you that have skills that you don't have. So in addition to those rehabilitators that are going to be your support system and your contacts for networking, it's also nice to have some of those people close to home. If you're going to just rehab on your own and maybe just do a handful of species, maybe you don't need this as much. Um, but if you are going to be an organization and a nonprofit, you're going to have to invite more people onto your team. You're going to have to have volunteers that help you with animal care. You're going to have to have people that serve on your board. You're going to have to have people that help you fundraise, right? Um, I cannot build an aviary. I got to find people that can, can build aviaries, right? So you want to keep that in mind too. A lot of times it feels like a single person sport, but it really is a team sport and you need to have those people in your network that you can rely on for all the things that you can't do yourself. So this is really the last thing that I want to leave you hit with um, here in this presentation um, where we're doing some soul searching and thinking about wildlife rehab. So again, that handout that I have for you, I really, really do recommend using that to put some pen on paper and think about, okay, what is going to be best for me, especially if you are um, new to rehab or just really kind of exploring that. I think writing some of that down is helpful in whatever format it is helpful for you, right? That's just one of the tools that you can use. Um, but one of the things that I do want to really um, emphasize is something that I think is, is important is what is your mission? Why are you here? Why do you want to be a wildlife rehabilitator? Why do you want to give up space in your home? Um, why do you want to spend hours feeding baby mice, right? What is it that makes you want to do this. So you can think of that as your personal mission. 
Um, so this, again, is not a topic that's, or a concept that's unique to wildlife rehab. But when you think about your personal mission statement, it's who um, you are as a person. So what defines you? What is your purpose, right? When you think of this in the context of wildlife rehab, you can do a personal mission statement for yourself overall, right, in your whole life. What's important to you? Why are you doing the things that you're doing? What is your purpose? What is your goal in life? What does that mean to you? But you also can make it very specific to wildlife rehab. So why, again, are you wanting to rehabilitate wildlife, right? Do you really love possums and you want to help possums in any way that you can? And wildlife rehab is one of the ways to do that. Um, do you want to right some of the wrongs of people? Um, so, you know, did you find a... Uh, goose that had been hit by a car and it just was one of those moments that just sent you on this personal journey and that you want to be one of those people that's that's one of the helpers you want to help ease suffering of these animals that don't have a lot of of other options right um, so there's lots of dog and cat rescues there's not a lot of options for wildlife do you care more about the individual animals or do you have more of a conservation um, ecology spin on things and want to think about overall population health and kind of how you can help support those missions and those those um, research opportunities and journeys and things right again. Um, West Shore Wildlife Center's mission is inspiring coexistence between people and wildlife. That was really the personal mission statement that I came up with myself in this journey. Um, and, you know, that's so it was, it was my nonprofit that I found. It's like it's to be the, the mission of the nonprofit, too. So our goal, my goal is not to rehab every single baby rabbit and have them live happily free forever. Right. My goal is to give people the tools that they need and the um, love that they need to want to live peacefully with wildlife. And I want to share my knowledge as a rehabilitator with other people so that they can assist in that as well, because the need for wildlife rehabilitators is not going to go away ever altogether. And it definitely is still increasing at this point. Um, so thinking about where you fit personally and what is important to you is going to help you make decisions that are good for you and are good for the animals and good for wildlife rehab and, and do the best for everybody in a, in a healthy way, right? So um, I kind of want to leave you with that, something to think about. Why are you here? Um, why do you want to do this? What is important to you? And then go out and, and do that, right? And, and fulfill your mission. So um, I have my email address up here. You should hopefully have that through the conference as well. Um, elsewhere, if, if you need to contact me, I don't think that I put it on the handouts. Maybe I can do that though um, before I, I upload those here in the next couple of days, just so that you have them. Um, but please, please, please do feel free to reach out to me anytime that you need to, right? So if you don't have um, a good support network of rehabilitators. I'm happy to be part of that support network for you. If you're having trouble finding someone to volunteer with and network with, I'm, I'm happy to um, help you with that. So, um, yeah, West Shore Wildlife Center at this point is not taking new volunteers, but I am definitely for anyone that has the initiative to come to this conference and, and take this presentation. We would be happy to have you. Um, I'd be happy to work with you and, and help you in any way that I can. Or if anyone wants to ask questions or talk about some of the things that we went through more, please, 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 you know, I mean, reach out to me and, and we can we can definitely do that and and think about that stuff. Um, I'm happy to support you. And, and so are a lot of the other rehabilitators in PA because we need you and our wildlife need you. And and we want we want everyone to be successful in whatever way that that looks for them and kind of this this rehab journey. Um, so like I said, I'm recording this in January. So I don't think quite the final like setup of how the, the conference and stuff is going to work. So I hope that we have a space available that we can do like a Q and a, if not, like I said, please feel me, feel free to contact me um, or we can, we can set something up to do something because I think there is a lot of value of just talking some of these, these
these things out loud and I'm always happy to talk wildlife rehab so I'm happy to to talk with you about anything okay so I appreciate you sticking with me this is a long presentation as I knew it would be um, again there's the second half as well so if you've kind of already thought about some of these things or feel like you know that you are definitely ready to to be a permanent rehabilitator the second presentation kind of goes through the nitty-gritty of the laws and the permitting and those kind of things that I can can talk to you about too um, so I hope to, to talk at you then again thank you everybody for coming to the conference virtually um, and, and sticking through with with all that and I hope to connect with you soon thanks everybody